Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Bob Griffin. I am a GM at IBM. I've had the privilege of being a sponsor since the inaugural event five years ago, back when we were a much smaller company, I2, and now since we've been acquired by IBM, part of the IBM company. In that time, I've introduced a variety of timely and important panels. As we have seen and heard from other panelists today, the movement from nation state actors to market state actors uh, is certainly making a massive impact and a massive change. Certainly a panel entitled The Future of Warf Warfare is indeed timely. So with that, let me introduce today's moderator. Kevin Barron is the executive editor of Defense One. He's a 15-year veteran of Washington's defense, national security, and foreign affairs scene. Kevin has covered the military, the Pentagon, Congress, and politics for foreign policy, National Journal, Stars and Stripes, one of my personal favorites, the Boston Globe, certainly the Washington Bureau, and the Center for Public Integrity. Kevin is the Vice President of the Pentagon Press Association, and with that, I will turn it over to Kevin. Thank you, and thank you for sticking around and making it through the day. We're getting into the wee hours of the afternoon here, uh, but we have a, a, another good panel, I hope. Um, this one on the future of warfare, and uh, we have a few topics to, I think, that'll cover that from cyber to some hardware and technology and how things are changing out there. So I'll help introduce our panelists now. It's an introduction to an introduction. Um, I have Dr. Stephen Chan, who's director of the Network Science Research Center at IBM. And on the far end, we have Lynn Dougal from Raytheon, many of you know, who says I'm allowed to call her the cyber chief or the cyber czar or whatever you want to call it. Uh, she, she's going to educate us all on cyber from Raytheon's perspective. And right back in the middle from CIA, we have Don Myricks, deputy director of the Directorate of Science and Technology. And maybe we'll start with you, Don, simply because I think the common theme I've heard today across all the panelists seems to be that whether you're in counterterrorism or you're in Intel or at DHS, wherever it is, everyone wants to say a little more, to explain a little more, to tell the story a little better, I think, uh, as we've moved beyond those war years and into this era of the global threats around the world and all the different ways we have to tackle them. Uh, everyone seems they feel they need to do a better job of explaining it. And I've said to them, I've said to some others as a journalist, I feel like we're in a moment kind of how we were five years ago with drones, where the cat was pretty much out of the bag. We all knew what was going on. We knew what was happening. But everyone had a lot of questions that needed answering. And eventually, the powers that be that control drone technology and signature strikes and everything about that world started to peel back layers and explain more and more. And now we have a pretty robust debate about what's going on. So when it comes to the future of warfare, um, in the cyber worlds that our other panelists here are involved with more and in your world as science and technology. Tell me where you are with that. Um, what, what do we know, what do we need to know more about the future technologies coming out of a place like CIA? Um, so let me talk to the trends that I see that impact how we need to think about the future in terms of how we support warfare or these various other kinds of operations that we get involved in. Um, obviously, the globalization of um, development and manufacturing uh, changes the way we think about our ability to bring to bear capabilities. Um, there's a lot of commercialization and commoditization of things that used to be unique provinces for us. For example, UAVs is a, is a great one, but also um, access to space, SpaceX, Skybox, um, high-end resolution. Uh, there's a lot of physical things that used to be strictly the purview of the intelligence community because it took literally hundreds of millions, billions of dollars and years to, to, to get those capabilities that are now available, broadly available. Um, and then there's the ubiquitousness of cyber. And I actually think that if we keep talking about cyber, we miss the point that the, the merge of physical and virtual is really, really where it's at. And if we, if we, if we don't grok that, that we've got huge problems. And I talk about the Internet of Things, the fact that um, smart refrigerators have been used in distributed denial of service attacks, the fact that smart light um, fluorescent LEDs are communicating that they need to be replaced, but also being hijacked for other things. Um, I talk about the fact that we, for example, in the intelligence community, do not bring wireless devices into work. When my clothes start to have smart tags, 
Um, if we don't get over this, then that's a level of transparency in the workforce that I do not want to deal with, I'm just saying, right? So we have all of these things going, and it cannot, we cannot respond in the typical way. So I think some of the things that I'm optimistic about in terms of where we go from here is that means we have to get very, very focused in some sense in terms of unique phenomenologies and unique capabilities that are absolutely essential for us to do our work but leverage like crazy all of the commercial and commoditization things that we're seeing going on. And by that I mean, you know, um, different phenomenologies that others are not going to develop early on. Um, Electro-optical from space is an obvious one for which there are a number of applications. Um, probably not so much right now, things like hyperspectral imaging. Although I imagine that that will happen, but that's, we have to figure out where our particular sweet spots are and how we use those. I think it also means we'll have to do a lot more with weak signals, sorry to be geeky, but hopefully everybody follows that, which then bears on this whole question about what do we retain and how long do we retain it, because those are the things that are the strategic differentiators. And I'm also optimistic because I still think that from a systems engineering complexity perspective, we are the best in the world, right? There are examples of um, the Russians, for example, completely replicating our space shuttle warts and all. And it took them years to figure out and actually understand the complex systems engineering and how to address that. There's lots of those examples. I still think that we are dominant. They're, um, the adversaries are, are catching up to us in terms of the eaches. And by that, I mean, you know, arguably China has the, the most performant, high performance computer on the planet today. What we're best at is bringing together um, all of the multidisciplinary capabilities that have been talked about and admired and are driving some of the discussions about how we organize. What, that's, that's our special sauce. That's our secret, our secret sauce in the way that we have been able to continue to stay ahead. And I think that's absolutely critical to how we maintain our ability to do what we need to do for in, um, the, the, the leadership of the United States government on a global scale going forward. Well, that's, you, know, you mentioned the Internet of Things. Uh, and Steve, we, we spoke earlier about the, the defense of infrastructure. You know, I think it's hard for me. I, I'm a national security journalist, I'm in this world, and it's hard for me to think of examples beyond something like Stuxnet as a real tactical example of, oh, I understand, there was a virus or something through the computer internet tubes that hits a, an event, a, a device somewhere and shuts it down. What, are we, what do we really need to worry about when we hear about the, all these you know, hyperb hyperbolic uh, warnings of cyber being the number one threat? You know, we, we talk about the grid for sure. What do we really need to worry about versus what maybe not so much when it comes to future warfare and how um, you know, adversaries can really shut down societies without even exploding anything. Sure, no, thanks for the question and thanks for the privilege of being here today. Uh, I, we heard from the Secretary of Homeland Security about the uh, non-metallic IDs and then we have of course the prototypical IDs and the Internet of Things. Uh, but there's another term of art I'd like to introduce called the materials internet, just as a bottom line upfront statement. So let me rewind back to last year where I started thinking about this space. And uh, you know, in our abstract for our panel, I saw nuclear. So thank goodness at a National Academy's brief, I learned a little bit about nuclear and translate to cyber deterrence. So there's definitely a lot of commonality in terms of the deterrence factor in nuclear. We heard about nuclear containment today. And the irony is that uh, much of our cyber law, Information Communications Act of 2009, et cetera, is predicated upon environmental spill law, so containment. So if indeed uh, containment is a, a part of it, then we start thinking about, let's say, uh, rough percentages of offensive capability versus defensive. And we do have phenomenal offensive capability. So let's then pivot to defense. And how are we in the area of, let's say, uh, cyber resiliency? And what does cyber resiliency mean? It could mean, to your point, a lot of the smart devices. We can go to Lowe's, Home Depot, buy the smart hubs with uh, smart uh, powered lights, et cetera. And the list kind of goes on to the whole smart power market. One of the fascinating things is uh, let's just take something very basic, you know, basic commodity items uh, like critical infrastructure, you know, energy, water, sewer. So we have this massive new observational space in terms of the cyber deterrence front because we have to be defend across this broad observational space. And amidst this broad observational space, how do we illuminate the weak signal and, and boost and see operations and things like that? The issue is of the critical infrastructure is that I don't need something very powerful. I can go to uh, Brookstone and buy a little two, three hundred dollar UAV quadcopter and carry full of mylar strips and just run into a substation, and that's a problem. And when the lights go out, when power goes out, uh, our water pumps go off. And when our water pumps go off, uh, raw sewage gets discharged. 
And then are our hospitals and the CDC, are they equipped to handle the, the ensuing problems? So these are all cascading kind of failure events that uh, you know, require an interstitial analysis in yeah. cyber. I think I've seen these TV commercials where that happens, right? And then ultimately, your grandfather gets shot because you were too cheap in the beginning to do the ultimate. Maybe there'll be an IBM commercial on that one day. Okay. Well, just to add, um, to me, the immensity of the attack landscape is is something that's startling. And I just recently learned, uh, ran across this fact that in 2020, which sounds a long way off, but it's you know five and a half years there'll be 6.8 billion people in the world and between 50 and 75 billion connections. And so when you think of every, you, know, you can run the math, each one of us through the internet, through our phones, through our refrigerators, through our picture frames, are gonna have these millions and millions and millions of, uh, of points of, of ins uh, insertion, if you will. Um, when you think about what the battle space is, it's much bigger, much broader, and much more personal than it's ever, ever been. Well, explain from, from your perspective as, uh, as, an in, as coming from industry, from Raytheon. So when we hear about cyber attacks and you know, how many million a day may hit your own company versus the DOD or one of the intel agencies, um, again, it's the kind of thing I think for, for the general public, for readers of, of news, that just gets lost on them. What does it mean for, for your company to get hit that often? What, what are the things that are, that are well, let's see, what are, the, what are adversaries going for versus um, what's to come in the future? Yeah, and we've said very publicly uh, our company as an example, and we're not unusual. Uh, we get 25 million attempted penetrations in a month. Um, that's kind of the, that, the natural ebb and flow of what we're doing. Um, when you say what does it mean, um, uh, we have been fortunate in that um, we started very, very early um, to living and breathing cyber defense. And so um, when we sold our first Patriot missile uh, outside the country, um, our networks came under attack. Uh, that was 40 some years ago. So it's nothing new for us. Um, we don't worry near as much as about how many times, how many error, arrows, if you will, are, are hitting the gate. Uh, we worry a lot about egress. And as you can imagine, there are millions and millions of ways to get into any network. Uh, you can manage egress uh, much, much easier, um, and we do. So um, if you're old enough to remember the old Eagles uh, song, it's you know the Hotel California where you can check in, you can just never check out. So that's kind of our philosophy. Well, so from the, from industry's perspective, are you, are you protected well enough? And I know the president's proposal for cybersecurity recently did not have any mandatories, if that's correct, right? So um, I'm, I'm going to guess that you think that's okay. Um, well, if I look at it from a, a, a cyber defense perspective, um, I think all of us in this room certainly know there's never enough. Um, we take a risk-balanced approach. Um, on what, uh, what would be the loss if we were attacked and it was successful and we invest um, accordingly. Um, the thing that has become more and more interesting, um, I think, um, as an industry, as we look at cyber, we've talked a lot about network cyber, whether it's on the defending or if we're on the attack mode. Uh, but I think what we have yet to really put enough thought around is how do we actually interject cyber onto the battlefield. And our combatant commanders today don't have robust uh, multiple cyber effect uh, to bring uh, to the battlefield, whether that be in a war zone, uh, you know, a peacekeeping, what, whatever um, uh, field that they're on. I think that's one of the next steps for where do we take next generation warfare. When you say that, do you mean a better coordination with, uh, between military, you know, traditional direct action uh, combat versus cyber and, and I, I or do, do you mean between the military and other parts of government right. that are involved now, um, so, or in, 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 including intelligence? So I think you look at it two ways. Yeah. Um, if we're going to be um, on the offensive in cyber, we're gonna have to prep the battlefield. And so when I look at those 50 billion things that are out there and interconnected, what types of things would we prep the battlefield for and have ready ahead of need. That would be one part of offensive cyber. The other part of offensive cyber would be the actual use, um, and it's exactly what Don was talking about, that di digital 
uh, mechanical conversion and integration where you would actually have cyber effects. Um, you know, people at think tanks these days say, you know, a cyber bullet. We're gonna have to have cyber bullet factories. We're gonna have to be creating cyber effects that can be delivered real time. So we'll have prepped the battlefield. This is the vision for the next generation warfare. And then we would have a factory of real time effects. And that leads you to, um, you know, probably the next big challenge in, in bringing that together. And that is, we do not have enough human beings um, that are able uh, to create those kind of effects today and the speed and the time that we need them. And um, I'd be very interested in your two experience on automation and how do we really take cyber from a, a human driven um, activity to what we might need to do to really work at speed. Uh, well, before you get to the solution of this, this human shortage, why is it? Why is there a human shortage and, and what what is both government and industry doing to address it? I mean, I've heard, I've heard it said, uh, we're never going to out-hire China in the realm of cyber. Um, what's needed? What's not happening? Well, from our perspective, um, it's a very new uh, domain. And so you look at, and I can go back and I can say, I remember being, coming up through the system, you know, systems engineering. There was never enough systems engineers. And then the software guys were hot. And you know, there seems to be kind of a rolling as technology goes and the complexity that Don was talking about where our um, university and school systems are always a little bit behind on, on curriculi. Um, I also think that this is a very integrative uh, field, and by that I mean it's not just book learning, it's pattern recognition, it's other things that are not easily taught. Um, and, and, and I also think um, that we have, we still are out there sawing logs with the, the, the saw, right? We haven't even got to the chainsaw, let alone you know, something bigger. And we do have to automate. Uh, the analytics piece, you know, the auto detection, uh, perhaps the auto generation of a cyber effect. I think all of those things, when you really think next generation, have to come to the forefront. Don, you're shaking your head. Kevin, yeah. you actually made the point when we started. Um, if you look back at Remington's big breakthrough was he stopped doing hand tooling of every big piece part, right? So if we use your analogy, which I liked, about we're kind of in we should be further along, in my opinion, but we're kind of in our infancy in terms of how we think about cyber and how it plays into the full um, effects capability that we can bring to bear. I also think the conversation that John McLaughlin and others had in terms of whether we're organized appropriately or not is a really, really big part of this conversation because, yes, we have a cyber command, but this is back to why would you empower an ambassador in, in certain key areas to bring together all of the national uh, means in order to affect and to, in order to, to cause local effects, but also to integrate with a, a national agenda. We have exactly the same problem, I think, from a cyber perspective. So there's the get out of the Remington, you know, one at a time sort of um, attack and actually uh, regularize, if you will, um, how this plays into the overall set weapon suite that we have available, but also then organize that so that it's appropriate and useful and also used a, used correctly locally as well as globally, right, to affect national objectives. That, that's all in work that needs to be done. Steve, how about for you, for your workforce? So, great, great point. So, <clears throat> on the workforce development side, so let's say I uh, pose a cyber scenario. And um, there's been a lot of natural disasters, Typhoon Haiyan, um, a couple weeks ago there was a, a quake near Alaska, and we're watching for the big illusion tsunami like the 146. So what happens if we have something like a denial of service attack on something very innocuous like a buoy, right? So this is, I'm gonna introduce two terms, heuristics and algorithmics. So we do a denial of service attack on a buoy which right now has a dial a buoy system. You get temperature, barometric pressure, all kinds of things to see if the, you know, there's good surfing that day, things like that. And there's other very practical uh, matters as well. But let's say those buoys were knocked out or worse if you spoofed it. So you think a tsunami is coming. Suddenly the adjutant general emergency preparedness coordinator, the SOP for some cities uh, in a situation where a tsunami is coming is to shut down the grid. That's a heuristic. Now each city is gonna have their own heuristic. So from a public private partnership perspective, is it meaningful to have a cohesive strategy or a sequence of events of what to do in a situation like that? Now 
I, I asked the question, what kind of occupational specialty is that? Is there an MOS, military occupational specialty, that fits that model? And, and if so, you know, what can the US do to kind of anneal our cyber capabilities? We need fake tsunami watchers. Well, yeah, so no one watched one thing. But uh, I'll give you a historical example. A historical example is from the, uh, we heard a lot of history today. I learned a great deal of, of today. But let's say from the 50s to the 80s, uh, the semi-automatic ground environment, the SAGE network was used by NORAD, North American Defense System. And this is pre-Watson, I2, Aurora, things like that. So before unstructured information management architecture. But very simply, there was radar. They wanted to see the enemy bombers. And there were observational posts. You had to fuse the two together. And that spawned uh, the creation of the class of computer programmers. So I'm not quite sure what class we're trying to spawn today. Are they data scientists? Are they cyber blank? Are they cyber what? But that's definitely a, a question we should all consider. What, what constitutes the entire ecosystem of cyber, which seems to be pretty, pretty broad in terms of and, you know, massive depth and breadth? So well, I, I can go in two directions, I guess. I think you mentioned McLaughlin earlier in the conversation, and I also, in addition to hearing that it's time to shed light on a lot more of these, we heard it's time for new organizational structures in a lot of these areas. Yet, I mentioned this summit too, I think we're still waiting for Senator Lieberman's cyber authority bill to come through, right? Um, what do you think is needed for, for those structures and where is it gonna come from? Um, this, I don't know if this is the right question for this panel, but we're here, so I wanna, I wanna get your answer on it. Um, Dawn, from you first. Okay. Well, I actually really agree, and part of what I do is I try to do a lot of an industry outreach. I really think for cyber, for some of the life cycles for, for technology, like to get to space is unfortunately kind of six to seven years. We talked about this earlier because just it takes three years to get on the launch manifest. And because of the environmentals and things like that, it takes a long time. Um, so we can continue to kind of work through that from a government perspective, and that works, right? until Skybox and SpaceX and others help us with that problem. On the cyber um, side, I really think, and I agree with what was said earlier, this has to be led by industry. I've had conversations with Mark Andreessen, for example, where it's like, y'all need to rally, and he agrees, right? And what we need to do, the government needs to do, you need to challenge us to keep up, right? The fact that we're still dealing with legislation that's been on the books since the late 1800s, literally, right? in terms of how we've gone forward and interpreted that in order to figure out what we should be doing, um, you get the results you deserve if you leave it to the government. And, and, and I mean that as a govy, right? Um, so we really need to figure out, I think, how we have, and I'm starting to see it. I'm starting to see conversations about the ethical use of data. And that's coming from the big data aggregators. It's not the government that is leading those discussions. And it also acknowledges that there are differences in how the Europeans view that versus the United States versus the Pan-Asian, and on and on, right? I mean, so it's starting to happen. I think it's happening slowly, but at least we're starting to see it. I think that's exactly the right conversation, and, and I'll give an example. If I get your VIN number for your vehicle, I can probably tell who you are. Do I need that to determine a pattern of life in order to figure out if you're a bad actor? No. Should I use it? No. Not because it's precluded in the current metadata discussions, because there's, but, but, but because there's no responsible reason to use it today until I know for a fact that I need to action something against your vehicle, right? Which then goes through all of the processes that we talked about. So I think the metadata conversation is way too narrow in terms of saying five fields that include your address. I think we're all gonna end up being um, advertising numbers, which will be much more um, specific than misspelling your name 37 ways, depending on your heritage, right? And so I think we're really, really early in this conversation. And if we mandate, if you let the government mandate things that are going to move, right, then we're going to be stuck in a regime that is nonsensical given where the industry is actually going to take us for a variety of reasons. So this really, the ethical use of data, I think, is absolutely essential to move that conversation forward and don't make the government be the lead on it because you will get answers that you do not appreciate and that you cannot live with. And I think that's really, really important to drive on. Is the commerce of that, that uh, government relying on, on private industry uh, means government is taking on more risk, especially when it comes to something like classified data or classified information. And I think specifically for uh, Amazon uh, uh, having uh, the, big, the big contract for the cloud. So I think there are multiple aspects to how we talk about security and risk, right? I think in the case of evolving business models, particularly with respect to um, information technology and commercial practices, the, the, the 
the government should not lead that. It will probably, you know, government has to deal with all of the eaches. So you get the ham-fisted solution because we have to aggregate across a very broad spectrum. That's, I think, not the right answer. There are other things that we really do have to protect. You know, we have agents in the field today that literally if, if that leaked out, people would die. Absolutely, right? That's a different kind of conversation. I'm not looking necessarily for the, the private sector to be there, although I will say, you know, we recently did a cloud acquisition and we're, we're gonna stand up our own node that's inside our own, you know, we're gonna do all of the leads, feeds, and speeds, right, kinds of stuff. So we can leverage it, and I guess that's the relationship that we're looking forward going forward, is we wanna leverage all the goodness that's coming from industry for certain critical business practices like ethical use of data, I think they're better positioned to have those initial conversations and drive it and, and then help the government figure out how to apply it for the kind of gnarly, hairy policy problems that we're having today. I really believe that if we lead those conversations, that's when everybody's gonna have maximum regret. I wonder if we could pivot a little off of cyber to some um, actual hardware technologies uh, as that's part of what this panel is supposed to be about as well when it comes to future warfare. And the, the idea floating around the criticism now that somehow the United States at this moment is losing its technological advantage in lots of areas. Um, is that true? Do you agree with that? Uh, and if so, in what areas do we need to be paying attention to a little more closely? And then we'll talk about what the solutions to that are. Well, I'll, I'll throw out a couple. Where are um, you losing at Raytheon? <laughs> Nowhere. I thought That's we were right. talking bigger than that. Go for it. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you know, I think um, as, as a proud American and I, I think somebody who's realistic, I think we have advantage in most all of the um, areas of standard warfare and in that I would include space. Um, but uh, I could be wrong on that because what we do know is that the, the, the advantage that we have shrinks and that, that rate of speed at which that is compressing is accelerating. And so it's kind of, to me, I get at dinner parties and I say, well, you know, we could argue whether we are or we're not, but we fundamentally know if we don't do some things differently and more aggressively and more cost effectively with the money we have to invest, whether it's today that we're behind or it's two years from now that we might be behind, I think that's kind of the critical thing that we have to keep our eye on. So, you know, as I look forward, um, you know, next gen war, I think that we will actually see small nukes. Um, you know, now we've been in a world of detente for a long time. Um, I think we will actually see uh, over the next 10 to 20 years uh, small nukes being brought to bear. Um, I think a lot about electronic warfare, what we can do there. Um, you know, spectrum is getting hugely congested. Um, what might we do there to advantage ourselves? And if we don't do anything, how might we be disadvantaged? Um, and then probably the other one on my hit parade would just be space. And really, you know, who is gonna command space and how and what might be the protocols in space? Uh, you talk about kind of a no policy zone that's, uh, <laughs> so that's a wide frontier. So those are a few off the top of my head. So I'll say that I, I think Lynn's hit the areas that we worry about too. And I, I mentioned this in my kind of opening comments. You really, really want to major in the majors. And we, I think we know, where it is that we can make unique differences that are not gonna be addressed or commoditized by industry in the near term. Now the good news is, is once we make those investments and, that, and finish the development, then it generally ends up becoming commoditized and then we can go to the next thing. This is always about finding the weak signal and whatever noise there is, right? Um, and there's lots of noise out there right now. So that's, that's what we have to do, I think, and to, to Kevin's um, point, we have robust conversations about that, uh, acknowledging what the panel said. I have a team right now. Um, we were at uh, OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology for the President yesterday talking to, to Dr. Holdren, and we're at OMB today having exactly those conversations because even in the down budget, there are absolutely areas that we need to maintain a capability in hard technology, um, let your mind, you, you can probably come up with what some of those are. No, tell us, please. No, <laughs> I won't go there. Uh, but but um, if, if you know what the community does, you know, uh, those things need, we need to prosecute those. We are having those hard conversations in spite of the current budget situation, and we are reaching across very broadly in order to get those, those um, platforms going. The other thing that I will say is that from, uh, just from a, 
again, I'll go back to my systems engineering complexity um, play that I talked about. I'll give another example of um, part of the, the, the people that we work very closely with are IARPA. And they did a number of um, studies wherein they looked at the value of intelligence information versus open source information. And for they looked at five markets, um, I'm sorry, six markets. And IARPA does most of their work on classified, so you can, you can see much of what they do. But five of the six showed hours, days, weeks sorts of advantages when you added intelligence information to open source information. So there are significant time to market, time to decision kinds of advantages that the intelligence community still brings to bear. And it is because of the fact that we are operating in these seams that are not um, interesting to others at this point. And what, I, what we're seeing is those seams are getting more narrow, but our ability to bring that together, specialize in those, and then bring those together in unique ways is our big advantage right now. And we will prosecute those relentlessly. I mean, that's, that's how we stay relevant to the problems that we have to address from a national security perspective. You know, and it might be interesting. I was shocked when I found this out, is uh, we were uh, talking with a major search firm and they said, um, you know, we actually only index 5% of available data. So when we're out there Googling and we think we're getting access to all the information, um, we are actually getting a much, much smaller subset than probably what we expect. And so when Don talks about, you know, taking and, and imagine what's out there at just the 5%, right? And, and so if you talk about that other 95% and how you can target that for increased intelligence, there is a broad opportunity space for, for very targeted, analytically sought out uh, data uh, to improve decision making. It's, it's a wide Steve, Steve what's your take on, on technological advantages and uh, being rapidly overtaken sure. by adversaries, uh, you know, at what's myth and what's reality? Hmm. Well, let's start. I agree with both my colleagues. So um, let me go with this in reverse order. Um, Definitely in the cyber opportunity uh, in terms of the deep web and the specialized portals, I think one of the things that um, we mathematically we are very good at, uh, let's say, um, is detecting uh, DNS traffic where there should be none via dark net pods, et cetera. And, and to your point, um, and you, since you mentioned OMB, the question is should government lead, should private industry lead? So I, I completely concur. Um, but I also would like to say something uh, positive in terms of uh, you know, the U.S. government side. I think the OMB... This is from IBM, ladies and gentlemen. He's about to say something positive. About <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I think I the need the industry of... government you know, to keep fighting sure, for, our, sure. for the newspapers. Well, let me give you a classic example. Okay, we're together. In 2003, we had the Northeast blackout. And one of the discoveries at the time was that forensically it's very difficult to find out what happened because there were variances among all the manufacturers of the 47 microseconds and basically all the, uh, the clocking was all different. In other words, we didn't have all synchronized GPS clocks across the board. So forensically, very difficult to analyze. Okay, now, th that's an interoperability standpoint. So from an interoperability standpoint, I think the Office of Management Budget, circuit number A119, is very good to help facilitate and move interoperability along. So can government be very useful? Absolutely. Can we use, uh, take advantage of other technologies, something very trite like uh, geospatial information systems? Absolutely. National Economic Council passed in 2009 the place-based memorandum that uh, you know, Larry Summers had been involved in as well. So yes, there's all these punctuating uh, points where government can help facilitate a public-private partnership kind of momentum type of effort. And, and there's actually some really interesting work. Mariana Mazzucato, who is from the University of Sussex, is actually looking at government-based innovation. And so she actually she looked at a bunch of test cases, and not well-known, but um, the United States government actually loaned half a billion dollars to Elon Musk to develop his battery technology. Touch screens came out of CIA investments from years ago. Um, language translation, Siri. That has been long-term investment by a number of government entities. So it really is a partnership. This idea that innovation only comes from a particular area, public or private, is just wrong and, and, and adds to the rhetoric that clouds the actual discussions that need to take place. Um, so I think that you're exactly right. There are, there are real partnerships that we need to pursue that actually result in moving the state of the practice forward significantly from an in industrial commoditization perspective. And th these conversations that happen through um, newspaper ads are not particularly useful in terms of ensuring that we have the public-private conversations that are essential for us to be successful. But here's where the opportunity is for the US, if I may. So we talked about the Internet of Things. And early on, we had uh, um, uh, Secretary of Homeland Security talk about the, the human smuggling example. 
And then we also heard uh, from TSA about the non-metallic IEDs, and in general with the DOD folks in this audience, a lot about IEDs. So here's the opportunity. We put a lot of money, $21 billion plus, into the fight against improvised explosive devices. TSA, uh, DHS has also put a lot on a human smuggling front, and here's where the White House has been very good about convening task forces on human smuggling because a bag of calcium ammonium nitrate, human, same size, and possibly the same tuttle, whatever it may be. These are adjacent spaces. These are isomorphic problems. We can learn, lessons learned from all these areas and do the channel consolidation that you're referencing to basically bridge and fuse together among the uh, interstitial analyses and bring it all together. That's the opportunity. Okay, so I, well, I think we're about ready to take some questions from the audience, so get your questions ready. I want, before we get to that, I just wanted to ask Don, explain to us what your office does. <laughs> so our what scope, do you really do? <laughs> well, I'm, I get to be um, um, Madam Q, so that's, you know, uh, th that's a pretty cool job, I've got to say. Um, so we do, we talked about this earlier, we do planes, trains, and automobiles, and I, I, I can't get any much more specific than that, but for example, we staff the National Reconnaissance Office, right, which is the, the organization that does much of our um, space constellation, <laughs> right? So we, we go from space to sea to, you know, um, we, we probably are the be most innovative organization for um, small power source devices for obvious reasons, right? Um, but we actually introduce much of the new chemistry that comes into the battery market for small battery um, um, technology and chemistry because we have that's where we have deep expertise because it's interesting to us and important to us. So the, the gamut of the office is very, very wide. We do tend to concentrate on the next generation of technology as, a, as opposed to several generations out, but I already said in space that means eight to 10 years. In IT, that's much closer in, you know, two to three years on our best day. So it's, um, I, I think I have one of the coolest <laughs> jobs on the planet, actually. So. You're cute. That's great. I love it. <laughs> I, we have a lot that's come out of this panel, and the one that keeps coming in my mind is I'm now deathly afraid of smart light bulbs. So let's uh, go to a question. We'll, we'll start right over here. And now wait for a microphone, and uh, as always, tell us uh, who you are and where you're from. My name's Al Cannon. I'm from Charleston, South Carolina, and I recently attended a technology forum where one of the speakers made a distinction between exponential and disruptive growth. And the example he used that was the automobile was disruptive growth in terms of the relationship with the horse and the buggy. But Henry Ford was a exponential growth. And he suggested that from a technological standpoint, we're in the, in the curve in, in exponential growth. So in, the, in that context, if that's an accurate assessment, could you apply that analysis to, to what you're talking about there? Because it, 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 you know, growth exponentially s speeds up, and you made some reference to it up there, but uh, are you looking at this in the context of that the quicker turnaround uh, as technology advances? So I'll, I'll yep. take a whirl at that, sir. <clears throat> So we map what you just said against a Lenski and Kunian timeline. Let's just make it very simple for one second. Let's say we're in a digital age now. In digital age, uh, you know, we have uh, planned technological evolutions, technological disruptions, massive, rapidly uh, these cycles of adaptation. And amidst all this, how do we avoid uh, architecting and designing a quote unquote modern day marginal line? So it turns out it's just one tiny bit of insight um, you know, it's quite amazing when we look at some of the, some of the adversaries, you know, non-state actor adversaries included. And their ability to adapt, you know, as, as a coder, we always complain, it's like, oh, that API has been deprecated again, it doesn't work, you know, broke my, uh, broke my little project. And, and this is a kind of constant cry. But one of the things that are kind of telltale marks is uh, cyber sophistication. So on one of the things, that what cyber sophistication means is, you know, in terms of a telltale signature, uh, I'll just give you a very simple example since we were had uh, one of the previous panels I talked about the human smuggling. So over the years, you know, certain colors resonate better with us. So the red hues really resonate to the uh, kind of consumers of the human trafficking side of things. But then uh, some people, you know, try to adjust their pictures through transmogrification, you know, thinner waistlines and, you know, better uh, aspect ratios, things like that. But there's some things that are very hard to manipulate. 
But if they do, it's an indicator of their uh, cyber sophistication. Specular highlights within the eyes, wrinkled geography around the, uh, the eyes, the mouth, et cetera, and aspect, different aspect ratios, and uh, mesh distortion modeling, and the list kind of goes on. And these are some of the kind of uh, great uh, opportunities for the U.S. to really excel in, to kind of mitigate against some of those uh, punctuating technological disruptions. And I think punctuating technological dis disruptions are misnomers, actually, because what you normally discover is that some groups of people have been doing research for years. You mentioned early on the material science. I expect that there's going to be something uh, that we can't even imagine today. Sure. Biological, you know, the, the merger of biological and cyber. Um, that, those are going to be viewed as disruptors, mm -hmm. although we all know they've been invested in for decades at this point, right? But when somebody finally figures out how to productize it in a way, that, you know, the, oh, I don't have my, I do have my cell phone with me. You know, it goes from the brick to something I can't imagine leaving my house without, then it's disruptive, hmm. right? So yes, we are monitoring those things and working closely with folks like this that are paying attention to how that would fundamentally change their business because it will fundamentally change ours as well. But to your point about the US having the opportunity to be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, very much so the biologists can do nature-inspired engineering, we can do translational biomedics to study nature to see how we can better design things, and then uh, there's a natural progression and convergence, so absolutely. Lynn, what about uh, this, this idea of, of are we in a, a period of exponential growth in certain technologies? Which one's for you? you know, um, this is not a technology, but what it's unarguable is we're exponentially growing in data. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at all the interconnectivity that we've talked about, you have the largest in situ sensor, right, with the internet and every device that is now hanging off that that's ever existed. And so when you think about the opportunity to know things through cyber analytics, through personal analytics, um, you guys have probably noticed that uh, even just the public analytics have really taken a step up of late. So you know how they used to, everybody said, okay, you, you know, they knew what I was buying and then they'd make recommendations. Well, now have you got the proximity marketing? Have you been hit by that yet? Where you're walking by the Starbucks and it pops up and says, I'll give you 50 cents off. Now, people don't get very scared about that, but if Dawn was doing that from the CIA, you know, we'd be, <laughs> we'd be worried. But that's where I think that exponentiality um, is, is just this huge uh, opportunity to be mined. Um, Thank you for saying the CIA was not the people that are putting yes, the pop-up ads on your not. phones. So. <laughs> we get accused of lots of things. I might as well take credit when we're not responsible. <laughs> I think the ability to respond at the speed of threat is a, is a kind of looming challenge. And we may talk about cyber, let's say, uh, let's say we use the word uh, influence operations. My big fear is that uh, other folks are applying influence operations on us. So let's just say we take a very simplistic uh, civil affairs approach and let's just say uh, uh, there's a PMISI A-scope framework, but I'll just take the PMISI, political, military, economic, social, infrastructure and information. Infrastructure big vulnerabilities. In terms of the big data, I heard the metaphor today, the hay, and I like that because uh, folks can throw more hay for us to kind of sift through and weed through, and that's a problem too. And the social fabric is, uh, you know, the UN Millennium Development Goals, there's basic commodities that we depend upon, energy, water, sewer, internet access, etc. But as we're being gamed in all these things, and there's massive astroturfing, disinformation, misinformation that we have to wade through, uh, are, are we being subject to uh, IO operations in cyberspace. And that's probably something we should uh, take a close look at as well. We said speed of response, and I think most more directly of, of um, in this realm, what is, what is a, the right kind of proportionate response? So let's say our grid is attacked. Do we attack back with the same thing? Is it, is it even right to think in that way of, well, we've got to be better at what they do to us, faster at what they can do to us, or beating it before it hits us? You know, I'm going to turn to my colleagues on that notion of attribution and measured responses with a lack of granularity. So why don't you two ladies take it? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Sure. <laughs> well, good news, attribution for cyber is a solved problem. So what's there? No, I'm teasing, okay. obviously. Um, yeah, this is, this is a big part of it. And I think this is what the panels all day have been kind of wandering around in terms of the what is the policy framework? What can we even articulate what our objectives are? And then do we have an organizational framework that can allow it to execute against that, right? I'm gonna claim that technologically we can do pretty much anything that you ask us to do short of cold room fusion. Um, but that has to be employed, the point was made, all technology is dual use, right? 
So it's the, the framework in which we operate that I think is really lacking right now in how we think about this. And um, we can get pretty close on attribution in many cases, depending on how much we're allowed to collect. I mean, there's that, you know, sort of Damocles that we're on again, right? So that's the conversation that I think really, really has to be addressed here. How's that for an answer? I, I like it, but I also like, <laughs> the, uh, I also like the all source aspect that you alluded to. Um, because and this gets into kind of a, a classification notion. Sometimes our best data sources come from um, places you would never imagine. So, so you've heard the classic Try joke, it. right? Here's a classic <laughs> joke. Classic joke is in the US, we've got lots of big data. But China has more because they bo have both theirs and ours. Yeah, that's, that's a joke, right? <laughs> but anyway, there's, there's these I massive- I heard that classic <laughs> joke, that's okay. <laughs> anyway, there's but these, I, I get there's it. these uh, big data repositories <laughs> because you really, to you kind of uh, illuminate these kind of weak signals among this massive observational space to basically remove the hay from the haystack, so to speak, to be left with a collection of needles by which to have human analysis basically then take a very close look at. Uh, these, are, these are big challenges, and how do you do that channel consolidation? Now, there's great opportunities. Uh, when Somalia had no central government, and uh, you could do massive channel consolidation there because you buy it from private industry, these are opportunities. So you kind of have to look across the whole uh, problem space. And I, I think, too, we, you know, again, when we, people start talking about cyber, I think very quickly you start to forget about actual conflict and war and battle space mm -hmm. and how that would then be used in those scenarios if the United States was going into a country, if they were defending against attacks as well. Let's move on to another, another question here. Uh, right here, this gentleman in the blue shirt. Uh, great panel, thanks. Uh, I'm Mark Anderson. I'm the CEO and founder of Inden IP, and I want to follow directly from what you're discussing right now, and take, uh, I guess, the challenge of if we're supposed to be talking about the future of warfare. I'd like to ask you all to think a little bit more out of the box. So uh, we've done a lot of work on the question of nation-sponsored theft of IP, particularly of crown jewel IP, like Boeing airplane designs and chip designs and so forth. If you ask Ian Lobin, which I've done, uh, he believes that all the major companies in Britain have already been penetrated. If you ask Keith Alexander, which I've done, the same is true for America. So if these men are right, then our major corporations have already been penetrated fully. And we've lost that battle, if you want to call it a battle. And if you believe that technology drives the global economy, this becomes really frightening. And so I'd like to ask you whether we're not missing the entire point by concentrating on the last war and not on the one that's being fought invisibly right, right now. Are we, in fact, in the middle of an economic war, losing GDP, losing jobs, losing traction, losing the telecom equipment sector at a time when we're trying to plan for something else? While, while other nation states are fully engaged, as Steve just mentioned, in uh, an economic war. I think state actors, um, you know, not to use China as an example again, but to your point, it's the simplest one right now. I think from the 100-hour air war in Iraq, they learned that you really can't uh, you know, compete with the U.S. in a conventional fashion, but you can from a perhaps an economic fashion as we pummeled the Iraqi uh, armor, which is mostly uh, Chinese-made, a good substance portion of Chinese-made. From the economic perspective, I, I completely agree with you too. And I also will say from the kind of cyber operational cycle standpoint, um, uh, the counterfeiters put out a lot of the spam and malware of the world too, which consumes our operational cycles. Uh, on the economic front, I think that, uh, you know, if you divide that both into uh, economic intelligence kind of side of things, it is a global economy after all. So I think that um, it, it's not so black and white. If I could just jump onto that. Um, so I think the fact that we're having these conversations and the fact that um, Scott was you know, very clear about what we should be considering from a national policy perspective when we make calculations about risk is exactly what we need to be doing to your point of is the next war an economic one because I think that absolutely that is the case. Um, I, I, I also think that there's a difference between having knowledge and knowing how to apply it and as a, let's see, as a young brand spanking new electrical engineer you know, I knew a lot of things about how to design circuits. They didn't work out very well when I was actually at the lab bench actually building things, right? So maybe a weak analogy, but nonetheless, the, I understand the concern and, and uh, it has to be addressed in terms of intellectual property being stolen, right? 
but the, and that's why I made the point about the, the, the um, space shuttle, right? There's a difference between having the knowledge and knowing how to apply it. I still think we have an advantage there, but we need to pay attention a lot. The other thing, and I'll just say this, is I read an article re recently in Fast Company about we are the second largest manufacturer on the planet. We tend to forget about that because the Chinese are so dominant. But one of the reasons, just in terms of the, the volume of what we manufacture, maybe not in terms of GDP, the reason is we are usually, if we're still in manufacturing, about 30 times more effective than the Chinese are. So if you look at just plain numbers in terms of contribution to GDP, then you get a different view than if you look at the units manufactured in the US. So I don't think it's as grim as people like to make it, you know, the, this quote about statistics, I won't repeat it because everybody here knows it, hopefully. But I think there's, there, there are things we need to pay attention to. I do believe economics is the next big frontier, but it's not as grim as I think it's been made out to be. We need to pay attention. But, but to your point, sir, on the, uh, the, there was a Senate bill, 921, I believe, which was the segue into the Cyber Bill, Homeland Security Protection Act, which did, through its legislative history, address the soft underbelly of America, the kind of R&D engine that you're referring to, our economic engine, and at the time, the uh, soft underbelly was academia. So they did address that. Back there in the, let's get Mika in the red dress. Thank you. Uh, the panelists have talked about the pace of technological change and the threats that we're gonna face from that. But, who, who are you? Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm Mika Oyang. I'm the director of the National Security Program at Third Way. Um, you've talked about the pace of change and the technological advances that we're seeing, but for the most part, our national security establishment and our acquisition systems take decades from concept to development. Can you talk a little bit about how we can ensure that our acquisition processes don't prevent us from addressing the pace of technological change and the threat it poses to our country? It's kind of the age-old question. Um, you know, We've all been through, you know, uh, if you're over 12, you've been through at least one cycle of acquisition reform. And um, <laughs> I think that um, the, the reality is that, um, you know, the, the commercial world is outpacing the government entities in so many different ways um, that what I wonder about, because I have no answer, um, I, I could pull out the 42 reports that have already been done on acquisition reform, but I, I do think that at some point, if drastic change isn't made early, uh, it's just become antiquated, it's a dinosaur, and then the commercial world will push so far in front of all the things that the commercial world can do. Um, that said, um, I see um, an intense effort uh, on uh, across my customer base, and I work with Intel agencies, DOD, um, I'm a big believer in the first step is acknowledgement, and they acknowledge that the speed at which they're going and, and more probably more important, the buying models, the whole cost plus award fee, really need to change to more a, a modern procurement cycle, a managed service, um, those kind of things. So I see a lot of atten intensity there. I see a lot of progress, um, but the results uh, are not showing up yet. We need to keep focused. Lynn, what, what are the areas that are doing at least better from in shrinking that, the time? Uh, is, it, um, is it in mobile? Is it in so where you know, satellite, I see, cyber? Where? Yeah, where I see the biggest gains is um, really in the IT infrastructure side. You've seen a clear ISP, ASP split across agencies, and we're really procuring the ISP layer, the, the infrastructure, and then you put your applications on top. And I think I'd, I'd compliment the community. I think that's going fast, um, and it's getting... Um, the, the right product to the client. Is this a problem in Q branch, or do you, do you get everything you need right away? <laughs> at, at CIA. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, that's you, you're Q branch. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. You said um, it. I so. ran acquisition for the intelligence community before I took this job, so I struggled with yep. this a lot. Um, I, and, and I have to agree, and, and I, uh, to quote Frank Kendall, who, was, who recently testified on the Hill on this, what we've tried to do in the acquisition community is, is substitute process for thinking and that doesn't work, right? So, um, and that was when all the, you know, kind of at various times when we have, you know, the tanker scandal or whatever, then what we do is we come up with a whole new set of checklists, 
but then we act like um, anybody can do this. So we take the person with the education, but maybe not the hands-on bench experience and put them in charge and they check all the blocks but miss the obvious problems in the application, right? And I saw this a lot. So we spent a lot of time actually with working on the personnel piece which was let get, let's get really proven technical chops. You all know this, right? When, some, when you have a great program manager, maybe they went to school, right? But it's like leadership. It's identifying that same sort of skill set, right? We spent a lot of time getting the right people in place to push forward the things that needed to be done. It still comes down to people, and that's the CIA is a people business. Um, so I think we're fortunate there. We also, candidly, don't have to adhere to all of the same regulations as everybody else, which helps us tremendously, right? We can do pilots. We don't tend to do, man you know, NRO has to do three of a kind. We do one of a kind, right? We get a lot more leeway, and we can also take a lot more risk. If NRO fails to launch something, there's a hole in the constellation. If we fail to launch something, then it's a new, unique capability that we don't have an appetite for yet, and we can take another whack at it. So I think that's a, we, We've had a very long and interesting partnership with the DOD, um, the agency has, in terms of, you know, like U2s and things like that, and we continue to do those things. I just can't talk about them here. Okay, I think we have, we have one more here, this gentleman in the red shirt. I have a microphone coming around. <coughs> Maurice Sonnenberg, understanding that some of this is classified, maybe a lot of it, one of the fears I have is quantum computing encryption and the competition we're facing. I'm glad you're smiling. Would you like to handle that? <laughs> yes, so we have a very robust, ongoing conversation in the community with respect to how close we think, um, that, so there's, there's a couple of pieces of quantum. One is quantum key. Right, and there seems to be a, um, some interesting work going on there. And another is quantum computing itself. For example, ask three engineers who know anything about D-Wave and you get four answers about whether or not that is actually a quantum computer, right? Um, so we are paying attention to this. There are substantial investments other places in the community against quantum. We spend a lot of time looking at algorithms. Um, you know, the, the basis is that it's not just zeros and ones, you know, it, it can be in multiple states simultaneously and how do you un, un, un pull that apart. So pure old zero one logic doesn't work anymore. So there's a whole vocabulary, how you do algorithms. Um, there's a whole set of things that need to be addressed here. I'm one of those people that think that on our best day, we're 20 years away. Um, there are others that want to say that it's five years away. Uh, split the difference. Um, when it happens, assuming that it happens, we've got a huge challenge, right? Because our whole, the, the key infrastructure that we've relied on from a departmental, from a DOD standpoint is, is, is susceptible at that point. So there's been a huge investment by really, really smart mathematicians. I'm an electrical engineer, so I'm not one of them. But I actually helped lead the discussion inside the intelligence community in my other job about how we were going to invest in this. And we are making um, significant investments and paying a lot of attention. I'll give you one other factoid, just because I know it. IARPA was doing a lot of work, unclassified work with quantum because of the, the distance we think we are away from actually having a viable quantum computer. And of the 70 principal investigators on the program, only 17 were US citizens. Let me also weigh in on the quantum <laughs> side, because I just want to articulate this. Quantum actually references non-classical. So for example, a superconductor is, uses quantum physics, because it's two electrons, Cooper pairs, traveling down, transport critical current together. So nowadays, we can basically, for very inexpensively, do custom chip design. So we can use uh, binary rules, but use uh, three-digit representations to get the basically same value with fewer digits, which saves computational cycles at the same time, so that's quantum as well. So there's a whole other side of the quantum as well, sir. So, yeah, there's lots of algorithmic development that's yes. going on that just uh, presumes that you have something that can assume multiple states, right? And, and developing the, what does it mean to have an operating system? What does it mean to do computations in that kind of environment? That, and that work can happen separately from the actual phys physical um, explorations that are going on. So in, in this realm, in, in our, our last comments, uh, briefly all three of you, where are you spending your money now? Let's put our monies where our mouths is. What's, what's the most important, um, what are the most important technologies or inventions, whatever it is forward, when you think of future of warfare that you're spending or you wish you were spending it? So I'll start. We're, we're spending a, um, a great deal of our money on phenomenology that we think is unique to us in terms of collectors. 
And the, the, the next big investment is, I hate to say it, but it's big data because it's so glib to say that, but it's the, the, it's the whole spectrum. It's the data scientists, developing data scientists, um, um, figuring out how we deal with high volume intelligence. Um, let's see, so the, the, the size of the data that we're talking about it dwarfs, for example, uh, uh, today's Twitter feeds, right? Um, and and that's, that, that is targeted collection, that's not random collection, that's just, we, we get a lot of stuff in. So we also have just the, how do you scale an infrastructure when you can't count on things like um, local deployments of Hadoop and MapReduce in order to be able to ha handle the volume of ingest. So those are the kinds of data, big data problems that we're working on and paired with uh, phenomenology, which will give us even bigger streams of data to deal with. Lynn? We would be looking at many of the same things. We're interested in what our clients are interested in. Uh, we look at EW, we look at Next Gen RF, what will be happening there, um, you know, missile technology. Um, I think uh, I totally uh, concur with the gentleman that said we're in economic warfare, but I have a feeling we'll be in kinetic warfare for quite a while to come. Uh, but for me personally, it's all about the data and the analytics and the cyber piece and how do we take systems like next generation GPS, right, that's going to do everything from drive our cars to do precision nav and targeting, uh, and how do you keep that robust from the threat? It's hard to compete against Q branch of the CIA, but as a 008 of the IBM Network Science Research Center, <laughs> I will, uh, I'll attempt to uh, give, give you an answer. We are taking a look very closely at the relationship of things. Um, because, um, and, and the best metaphor I would give is uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. You know, married, divorced, married, divorced, and it keeps going on. So the relationship <laughs> changes temporarily over time. And what are the continuous function of mathematics to kind of map that out? And the other thing kind of, uh, apart from the trillions of objects that we're endeavoring to gauge in is kind of analytics on analytics. Because one thing we are dreadfully afraid of is to come up with a specious conclusion. And here's a 30 second example. You have a, a satellite image and the lights are getting brighter, night lights. And it looks like, hmm, you know what? There's more activity in these Somali villages. Perhaps Al-Shabaab is, you know, it, you know, basically operating out of there. But then we look at the UN figures and say, so, hold on a second, the fishermen actually should theoretically reinvest about 40 to 45 percent into the local fishing village. So if Al-Shabaab's there, the, actually the light should get dimmer because Al-Shabaab will pull the money out. So that analytics on analytics is what we call in, at IBM A2O. So uh, relationship of things and A2O is what we're, what we're putting our chips on. Okay, you've thoroughly blown my mind. And this has been a, a great panel. I would hate to burst your bubble, though. I'm pretty sure 008's the one who gets killed in the beginning of the movies, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. I, you know, but, but I wish you all great luck. Uh, thank, you to, thank you to Aspen for having us and for this panel. And uh, stay tuned for more.